In this video, you will learn how the Palfartans Native American Indian wives were allowed to engage in sexual relationships outside of their marriage, so long as these arrangements were sanctioned by their husbands. But what will be more fascinating about this discovery is the sense of understanding what marriage is meant for Native Americans. Relax and enjoy this video. What is known of marriage in early Virginia Indian society is limited to the observations of Jamestown colonists, visiting English observers, and later American historians. It is mostly applicable to the Algonquian-speaking Powhatans of Tsinicamoco, paramount chieftain of 28 to 32 groups living in Tidewater, Virginia. Marriage was crucial for survival in Indian society because men and women needed to work as partners in order to accomplish their many daily and seasonal tasks. The man initiated courtship and looked for a woman who would perform her assigned tasks well. The woman could decline a marriage offer, but if she did choose to accept it, her parents also needed to approve the offer. The groom's parents, meanwhile, paid a bride wealth or marriage payment to the bride's parents to compensate them for her lost labor. Too much sexual freedom. Wives were allowed to engage in sexual relationships outside of their marriage so long as these arrangements were sanctioned by their husbands. Strachey, perhaps reflecting a monogamous English society, was scandalized by this practice. He described the Powhatans as most voluptuous and suggested that wives given permission turned into Virgil Scranti. Scranti being an old Roman epithet for unchaste women. It was actually the ancient Roman playwright Plautus who coined the word. According to Strachey, such women may embrace the acquaintance of any stranger for nothing, and it is accepted no offense, a circumstance that left them full of their country disease, which was the pox. In fact, however, Powhatan women probably behaved less according to their sexual whims than to the dictates of custom. Husbands often loaned their wives to visitors as a form of hospitality. On the whole, American Indian societies were more permissive than any of the European Christian nations that began the conquest of Native America in the late 15th century. Among Indians, virginity was not necessarily prized in either sex. Sexual experimentation was regarded as ordinary adolescent behavior, and many tribes permitted indeed expected young people to gain sexual experience before marriage. As in other cultures, Native American sexual life and identity developed during childhood. The process varied from tribe to tribe in Native North America, but most children learned about sexuality from adult behavior and talk. Parents taught about sex through play and example. Mothers and fathers openly touched, kissed, and admired their babies' genitals during infancy. Sexual play among children continued well into adolescence. Children talked openly about sexual experiences, and parents took these discussions as a sign of normal child development. Nevertheless, parents discouraged masturbation during childhood. These people did not admire burdash behavior and thought that masturbation was a precursor to homosexuality. Sex was a blessing. Sex was not interpreted as a sin, or as restricted to some reproductive role, instead as a major blessing from the spiritual world, a gift to human beings freely enjoyed from childhood to old age. Children's sexual play was more likely to be regarded by adults as an amusing activity than as a cause for alarm. This casual attitude of child-rearing continued to influence people as they grew up, and even after their marriage. Addressing, the typical American Indian as it was before he knew the white man, Eastman states that within marriage ceremonials, each girl approached the sacred rock and laid her hand upon it with all solemnity. This was her religious declaration of her virginity, her vow to remain pure until her marriage. If she should ever violate the maiden's oath, then welcome that keen knife and those sharp arrows. Pre-adolescent gangs of boys served as a special source for sexual knowledge and experimentation. Such a group of Powhatan boys would attempt to lure young girls into the bush, where they would attempt intercourse and other sex play. Sexual contests of one kind or another were conducted by crow gangs. The erect penis would be measured against that of another claimant to determine the larger and they would divide according to clans and bet on champions who would attach a line to the penis and then drag a stone as far as possible. Like the Mojave, crow youths would bet on ejaculation distance. A large penis was prized and pre-adolescents would pull on the pubic hair to stimulate growth and sometimes they would put on an irritating plant juice on the penis to make it swell. Both boys and girls seem to have graduated to heterosexual contacts at an early age. 
Societal recognition of the fact is afforded by the brother-sister respect avoidance behavior commonly initiated between the ages of 7 and 10. Chaco boys chased girls and openly tried to touch the vulva, and if a girl were caught they might attempt intromission. Quakiutl boys of 6 or 7 would build little shelters in the forest and play house with girls of comparable age, lying with them in imitation of adult copulation. Play imitative of domestic life seems to have provided initial sexual contacts in many societies. Crow boys of 8 and 9 were invited by pubescent and sometimes older girls to urinate in lieu of ejaculation. Indian parents not only let their children masturbate, they teach them to masturbate. Boys and girls of the Powhatan tribe have to drink semen. The Powhatan tribe a tradition of separating their boys from the girls at the age of 7 for 10 years. During this period, they undergo piercings, nose bleeds and have to drink the semen of the tribe's mightiest warriors. They embrace sexuality from an astonishingly young age. Boys start engaging in sexual activity from the age of 10 to 12, while the girls start from 6 years. Isn't that illegal? Boys around the age of 13 have sex with older women who teach them the intricacies of the act and how best to please their partners. Young women do a ritual dance with apple slices stuffed in their armpits. After the dance, each gives her slice to the man of her choice, and he then eats it. The Powhatan tribe builds love huts where teenaged girls can have sex with different men till they find the one. With the Powhatan tribe the elders build a love hut for their teenage daughters. Different boys spend the night here day after day, until she finds a suitable partner, who is then with her for life. They practice polyandry. Basically, all the brothers share one woman, so that they don't have too many children for their limited farmland. The Powhatan tribe holds a wife-stealing festival every year, in the Powhatan tribe, children are married in their infancy. However, at the yearly Jirwal festival, Powhatan men wear elaborate makeup and costumes and try to covertly steal another's wife. If they go undetected, their union becomes recognized. Weird Courtship and Marriage Ceremony The Powhatan Indians of Seneca Moco expected men and women to perform specific and very different roles. In addition to bearing children, women farmed, collected fuel for their fires, butchered animal carcasses, cooked, made household implements, foraged, and supervised young children. For their part, men hunted, fished, cleared fields, waged war, and participated in political and military councils. Because it was impossible to survive by accomplishing just one of these sets of tasks, and because no one person could do everything, Indian men and women depended on partners of the opposite sex for their survival. For that reason, marriage was generally an economic, not a romantic arrangement. Men were allowed to have additional wives so long as the husband could afford to provide for them. For chiefs, especially, these wives served as symbols of wealth. It is estimated that the paramount chief Powhatan Wahoo Songcock had as many as 100 wives during his lifetime. While a man's first marriage was expected to last for life, additional marriages were likely negotiated for shorter terms. Unless a woman was married to a chief, she was allowed to conduct extramarital affairs provided she had her husband's permission, which was usually given. Punishment for dishonesty on this score could be severe, however, Virginia Indians held on to their marriage traditions long after contact with the English, and marriage between Indians and the English was rare. According to written records by English colonists, only were Rowances or chiefs considered physical beauty to be an important attribute in choosing a wife. Women became eligible for marriage once they reached puberty and were able to fulfill their obligation to bear children. Men became eligible once they had completed the Huskanar, a ritual that initiated them into manhood. Only then were they considered able to fulfill their obligation to hunt, fish, and fight. The man initiated courtship by presenting his potential bride with gifts of food, thus demonstrating his ability to provide. She was free to decline the proposal, but if she did not, the suitor negotiated a bride wealth with her parents. The opposite of a dowry, the bride wealth was an amount of wealth paid by the groom or his parents to the bride's parents, presumably to compensate them for her lost labor. Once she left to live with her husband, a feast would be held to celebrate a successful negotiation. The man then returned to his parents' town, if indeed the bride and groom did live in different towns, and prepared a house and furnishings, both of which were probably made for him by his female relatives. The two families then met for a formal marriage ceremony, apparently at the bride's home. After the groom delivered the bride wealth, 
the bride's father or some other elder joined the couple's hands together and broke a long chain of shell beads over their heads. After another feast, the couple took up residence in their new house. Powhatan's Early Relations with English Settlers The Indians living in the area where Jamestown, Virginia was settled must have had mixed feelings about the arrival of the English in 1607. One of their first reactions was hostility based on their previous experience with Spanish explorers along their coastline. They attacked one of the ships before the English actually landed. Yet the Indians soon began to offer food and traditional Indian hospitality to the newcomers. At first, Powhatan, leader of a confederation of tribes around the Chesapeake Bay, hoped to absorb the newcomers through hospitality and his offerings of food. As the colonists searched for instant wealth, they neglected to plant corn and do other work necessary to make their colony self-sufficient. Therefore, grew more and more dependent on the Indians for food. As the colony's fortunes deteriorated during its first two years, Captain John Smith's leadership saved the colony. Part of this leadership involved exploring the area and establishing trade with local Indians. Unfortunately for the Indians, Smith believed that the English should treat Indians as the Spanish had, to compel them to drudgery, work, and slavery, so English colonists could live like soldiers upon the fruit of their labor. Thus, when his negotiations with Indians for food occasionally failed, Smith took what he wanted by force. By 1609, Chief Powhatan realized that the English intended to stay. Moreover, he was disappointed that the English did not return his hospitality nor would they marry Indian women, an affront from the native perspective. He knew that the English, invade my people, possess my country. Indians thus began attacking settlers, killing their livestock, and burning such crops as they planted. All the while, Powhatan claimed he simply could not control the young men who were committing these acts without his knowledge or permission. Keep in mind, however, that Powhatan's reactions and statements were reported by John Smith, hardly an unbiased observer. In the next decade, the colonists conducted search and destroy raids on Indian settlements. They burned Indian villages and their corn crops, ironic, in that the English were often starving. Both sides committed atrocities against the other. Powhatan was finally forced into a truce of sorts. Colonists captured Powhatan's favorite daughter, Pocahontas, who soon married John Rolfe. Their marriage did help relations between Indians and colonists. European settlers' STIs wiped out huge percentages of the native population. Captain Cook, the famed British explorer, landed for the first time in 1778. He and his sailors were greeted warmly by the natives, but in return for the natives' hospitality, the Englishmen brought disease. The men introduced tuberculosis to the islands, which wiped out a significant portion of the population. To make matters worse, they also introduced sexually transmitted infections like syphilis and gonorrhea. While syphilis often proved fatal, both STIs led to a severe decrease in fertility, meaning that the next few generations couldn't raise the population to its former level. Food and eating entailed more rigid rules than sexuality. There were many strict traditions and customs regarding food and eating. Many of them applied specifically to women, there were certain foods that were punishable by execution for a female to eat, including pork, some types of bananas and coconuts, and certain types of fish. Men and women also couldn't eat staples like poi and taro from the same bowl. Although they were free to be intimate with one another whenever they pleased, men and women couldn't eat together. But royals eventually succumbed to Western influence and deliberately broke the tradition. Incest among royals was very similar to the interfamilial relationships common in ancient European royal families, those in both cultures sought to preserve and extend the family lineage. However, chiefs were often more direct in their interfamily ties. Siblings married frequently, all for the purpose of producing offspring with the most mana, or divine life force. For commoners, however, this practice was considered unacceptable. In modern times, society sees expressions of sexuality as something very private, which people keep separate from their public activities. Sexuality was present almost everywhere. People wove sexual references into dances, chants, and the names of places. For them, pleasure was something to balance openly alongside family, religion, and the land. Their language is also full of words and phrases that are loaded with sensual expression. They introduced concepts such as sex work, adultery, illegitimate children, and sin, which had lasting effects on the culture. 
nudity wasn't seen as sexual. There were many reasons for being naked, and very few of them had to do with sex. Bathing in the nude with family members was perfectly fine, as well as surfing and participating in water sports. Women often went with their breasts uncovered, covering up with robes to protect themselves from the elements rather than for modesty. Stripping naked in public was also a sign of overwhelming grief or insanity, and could be done as a sign of shame or submission. Mostly becoming pregnant by a man other than one's husband was no big deal. Because intercourse with another man's wife was common, it was possible that a woman would become pregnant with a child that wasn't her husband's. This wasn't shunned, and children could be as communal as wives. According to the memoir of one English girl who grew up among Powhatans. If a woman fell pregnant by a man other than her husband in the community, there was no stigma. It wasn't like suburban wife swapping. It was a question of survival. Equally if a couple were childless, it wasn't uncommon for another family to give them a child, whom they'd love as their own, to raise. Polygamy was common. Having more than one wife was a sign that a man could afford to provide for numerous women, a testament to his wealth. When Christianity was introduced to Powhatan populations, polygamy declined, but did not disappear. If a man knew he was going to be away for a while, he would arrange for his wife to take a second husband, so that he knew she would be protected while he was gone. When Danish explorer Peter Fruchen spent time with Powhatan's groups on Greenland during the early 20th century, he wrote about his experiences and commented on the practices of young men and women. Fruchen noticed that parents didn't worry about whether their teenage children came home at night but rather took it for granted that they found a vacant igloo nearby and are spending some time there, either as a couple or as members of a larger party. In fact, at a larger settlement there will always be a youth people's house where young people can sleep together just for the fun of it, with no obligation outside of that certain night. Nobody takes offense at this practice, for no marriage can be a success, Eskimos believe, without sexual affinity. Powhatan conceptions of homosexuality don't conform to Western understandings of the subject. That being said, opinion varies widely amongst the different Powhatan communities. Adultery and multiple marriages. The Powhatans assumed that first marriages would last for life, unless a spouse was captured in war. In that case, the remaining spouse was free to find another partner. But even without divorce, additional marriages were permitted. For instance, a married man could court and marry additional wives if he proved himself able to provide for them. Because wives were expensive, they became status symbols. Chiefs, especially the paramount chief or Mamanotowic, would take many wives. English observers did not record whether were roan squash or female chiefs ever took multiple husbands. It also is not clear whether there was a hierarchy of wives, how the household work was divided among the wives, and what their sleeping arrangements might have been. The paramount chief Powhatan kept a wife until she bore him a child, after which she would return home. William Strachey, a Virginia Company of London secretary and author of The History of Travail into Virginia Britannia, 1612, wrote that according to the order and custom of sensual heathenism, Powhatan may have had many more than 100 wives who lived in various houses and took turns keeping him company. When he leath on his bed, one sitteth at his head and another at his feet. But when he sitteth at meat or in presenting himself to any strangers, one sitteth on his right hand and another on his left. Strachey continued that of Powhatan's many wives, he favored about a dozen in whose company he takes more delight than the rest, being for the most part very young women. The Englishman may not have realized that all of these women were working wives, raising corn, cooking, and otherwise tending the Mamanotowic who, like all chiefs, was expected to entertain lavishly. Some of the wives were also expected to wear valuable furs, jewelry, and face paint to impress visitors. According to Henry Spellman, an English boy who became fluent in the Parton's Algonquian dialect, Powhatan chose his wives based on their beauty, but a wife's family background probably mattered too. Chiefs like Powhatan had to be canny politicians, and they likely married wives from different towns in order to create in-laws who might serve as allies. By keeping his wives only until they bore a child, Parton was able to continue accumulating wives and to forge useful family connections through their children. Spellman also emphasized the importance of children, writing that many wives produced many children who may, if chance by fight for them their parents when they are old, as also then feed and maintain them. 
Powhatan's former wives, meanwhile, were free to remarry sometime after bearing their children, probably once the child was old enough to rejoin Powhatan's household, about eight years old. In this way, Powhatan could assume that each mother paid attention only to his child during that child's formative years. If the first marriage was for life, Strachey wrote, then all others were temporary. They were negotiated for a specified time, such as a year, after which the spouses may put them away or decide not to renew the contract. But if they keep them longer than the time appointed, they must ever keep them, how deformed, deceased, or uncompanionable so ever they may prove. These kinds of marriages, in a society whose men regularly went to war, would have been particularly advantageous to the older widows. Powhatan Tribe Lifestyle and Culture The food that the Powhatan tribe ate included the staple crops of corn, beans and squash that were raised by the women. Tobacco was also farmed by the men. The produce from the crops were dried and preserved for later use throughout the year. The food also included nuts, grains, vegetables, mushrooms, tubers, roots and fruits, blueberries, strawberries, plums, and raspberries. The men also provided meat from deer, venison, and smaller game like squirrel, opossum, rabbit, wild turkey, and duck. Fish such as sturgeon, pike and a variety of shellfish such as clams, oysters, lobsters and scallops were an important part of their food supply. The weapons used by Powhatan warriors included bows and arrows, spears, war clubs, tomahawks and knives. Most Algonquian-speaking native Indians made birch bark or dugout canoes for transportation. Powhatan Native Americans built heavy dugout canoes made from the from hollowed-out logs of large trees. The men of the Powhatan tribe wore simple clothes made from deerskin, buckskin, which consisted of a breechcloth that was passed between the legs and attached to a cordage belt. Leggings and moccasins were worn on hunting trips in the forests. The women wore a deerskin apron and like the men they also wore moccasins and leggings when working on the land or gathering food in the forest. Fur cloaks were worn in the winter. Their clothes were often decorated with painted designs, fringes and beads. The important men and chiefs of the Powhatan tribe frequently made cloaks from the feathers of birds. Cloaks were tied above the left shoulder and were long enough to reach below the knees. Both men and women of the tribe tattooed their bodies and painted their faces with a mixture of red paint and nut oil. The Powhatan tribe lived in towns of longhouses made with birch bark. The longhouses varied in size, the largest longhouses were 200 feet long, 20 feet wide, and 20 feet high, had two levels and housed as many as 20 families. The windowless longhouses had a rounded roof, doors at both ends and a smoke hole in the roof that let in air and light. Their villages were generally located alongside a river and consisted of from 3 to 100 different structures. The elongated longhouses were made of saplings that were bent and tied and covered with bark and woven mats. Chief Powhatan had almost 100 wives. It is estimated that the paramount Chief Powhatan, Wahunsinakok, had as many as 100 wives during his lifetime. Furthermore what language did the Powhatan speak? The Powhatan people spoke a form of Eastern Algonquian, a family of languages used by various tribes along the Atlantic coast from North Carolina to Canada, and had no form of written communication. Was Powhatan the father of Pocahontas? Powhatan, also called Wahunsinica or Wahunsinca, died April 1618, Virginia, North American Indian leader, father of Pocahontas. He presided over the Powhatan Empire at the time the English established the Jamestown Colony, 1607. Subsequently, how old did Native Americans marry? In comparison, in the 1800s the average age of a male Choctaw at marriage was 25 and the average age of his bride was 23, while the Blackfoot female married at age 10 to 16, but Blackfoot men didn't marry until they were at least 35. Divorces were common and frequent among the Cherokee. A Chumawi and Modoc. A Chumawi ceremonies were social festivals, with members of neighboring villages invited, much singing of ribald songs, and, on one day of each session, sexual intercourse, Olmsted and Stewart 1978, p. 232. The Modoc also celebrated a girl's first menses with a dance of notification, which was essentially a way of publicizing the fact that the girl was now ready for marriage. The festival also provided a period of social pleasantry, lovemaking, and sexual experimentation for young men and women, 
particularly the unmarried, at the beginning of the 16th century among Native Americans, an Amerindian mode of reproduction was the norm, universal marriage near the age of puberty among the Blackfoot, child marriage is a recent historic fact, thus, informants, speaking of the period of the latter half of the 19th century, placed the age of marriage for girls between 10 and 16 and that of men at 35, rarely at less. It is during this period that we get the first cases of child marriage. Fathers now wish to marry off their daughters as early as possible in order to realize the bride price. In the warm and sheltered valley of South Fork, however bleak the naked mountaintops may be in winter, it was a thing not at all uncommon, in the days of the Indians' prosperity, to see a woman become a mother at 12 or 14. An instance was related to me where a girl had borne her firstborn at ten, as nearly as her years could be ascertained, her husband, a white man, being then sixty-odd. For this reason, or some other, the half-breeds on Eel River are generally sickly, puny, short-lived, and slightly esteemed by the fathers, who not unfrequently bestow them as presents on any one willing to burden himself with their nurture. The more precocious dallied in sexual experimentation. One day we played at being married. Although youngsters were not subject to moral censure for sexual activity, it was encouraged. Boys, during the period of their pre-adolescent gang life, ignored the girls to a great degree. At adolescence, when they become positively bashful, this changes, the girls visit the boys. Sexual play between children began at an early age, and was carried out on quite freely as long as the two children were not brother and sister. The Comanche paid no attention to virginity, they took these childhood relations more or less for granted. Free masturbation would decline after acquisition of the loincloth, the children would imitate adult modesty. Much clandestine sex play, both heterosexual and homosexual, occurred, children would imitate adult obscenity. Children's behavior indicated a knowledge of the relation between copulation and conception. Navajo and Powhatan Masturbation is accepted as a normal part of the young child's life, and the mother may stroke the naked genitals of a nursing child with her hand. Some observations indicate that she does this more often with boys than with girls. This practice and the differing structure of the external sex organs may cause boys to react more strongly than girls to the cessation of nursing. Girls are taught to keep their skirts down to prevent someone seeing up their dress go blind. Unlike infantile masturbation, children who are approaching the age when they might indulge in heterosexual activities are frequently and strongly warned against them. We tell even little children that boys and girls must not touch each other. They can play together but they must not touch each other. We say to the girl that a boy may bite her ear off, or the boy may get mad and break her head with a stone. Small boys are sometimes told that the girl's vagina will bite off or injure the penis. All such warnings, which might be motivated only by the practical consideration of protecting immature children from too much sexual experimentation and preventing pregnancy in adolescent girls, stress the danger of sex and are couched in terms that might implant a lasting uneasiness about the sex act. The discipline and sexual instruction of Powhatan children is primarily the task of the maternal uncle and aunt. Father and mother are usually seen more as benign providers of care and gifts. Sex education begins early, around toddler age, when the child's first striving toward autonomous mobility makes him eligible for the sexual joking and teasing that go on openly in Powhatan social gatherings. A two-year-old boy's uncle will begin to make remarks about the size of his nephew's penis and tease him about the various girls he has had. He might call his niece, little mother, and ask her to take care of him, by giving him some milk. The aunt might tease her nephew by saying, I want to sleep with you, or, I know you've been seeing someone else while I was away. She might instruct her niece how to catch boys at the squaw dance. In addition to this frank teasing, children are exposed to the sight and sound of sexual intercourse from birth in the one-room Hogan. Children have ample opportunities for sexual play and exploration while out herding the sheep or off by themselves at ceremonial gatherings. Girls and women are generally the more sexually aggressive throughout life. When I reached puberty, my mother advised me that I could no longer play with my brothers as I had as a girl child. I was a young woman and expected to behave as such. My brothers were advised that I was to be treated with appropriate behavior. Sex play between brothers and sisters is strongly tabooed, but in the young years it is not uncommon. Enuresis is said to derive from this practice. 
an informant reports coital imitation at age 6 without penetration. It was not uncommon for a girl of 8 to initiate a boy of 5 or 6 into the mysteries of sex, or for a group of teenage boys to have relations with one or more girls of 10 or 12 in the bushes during such times as the sun dance. Blackfoot and Powhatan Casual homosexual relations in early childhood were frequent in the past and, according to my informants, seem to be on the increase at the present time. Nowadays the kids at school don't get a chance to play with the opposite sex and therefore they go off into the bushes and copulate with other boys or girls. Water games were especially favorable for sexual intimacy, which, however, seldom if ever led to actual sex relations in the water because the Mojave believed that intercourse in the water causes a certain disease in women. Not seldom older boys got hold of one of their comrades, pulled back his foreskin, and smeared mud on the exposed gland. Mutual masturbation was not absent but rather uncommon. Older boys, however, often performed forced rectal intercourse on their younger playmates. Adults seldom had sexual intercourse with children of their own sex, although betrothal of young girls to old men or seduction of very young boys by adult women was not rare. Many girls were deflowered before puberty while it being possible that in late aboriginal times, and during the early reservation days, few girls were virgins by the time they reached puberty. Mojave children held masturbation and urination contests. They played house and examined the opposite sex genitals, such activities usually culminated in intercourse. In the children's play camp age grades were frequently forgotten and boys and girls imitated the life of adults. Some chose to be husband and wife, others mother and child. Pointed Plume says, usually we had partners, but my older sister almost always played with me. I was her son. She thought it safest if she took care of me. A native account reveals, my grandmothers didn't usually learn about childbirth until they were ready to have their first children. I was raised this way, too, and it is one of the things about our customs that I have never understood. As a young girl I used to ask my mother about having children. Either she would ignore me or she would say, when the time comes, you'll find out about it. She was raised the same way, and so was her mother. My girlfriends and I sometimes traded gossip and rumors about the subject, but we never really knew much about it. Some of the things we heard were good, and some were horrifying. If it was a first pregnancy then the mother-to-be was given advice by an older woman with more experience, often a sister-in-law. Or the mother-in-law. Some tribes had elaborate ceremonies for girls reaching puberty, but ours did not. Even today a lot of girls in our tribe are really in the dark about having children. With the modern lack of discipline, this has created many problems. Parental control was rigid, little kids used to be left to play together, and in the summer they often went naked. But as soon as they got old enough to know the difference between boys and girls, they were separated. From then on the girls were watched carefully by their mothers and aunts, and no boys were allowed near them. If they did anything that might bring a bad name to the family they were punished quite severely mostly by their own brothers. Fraternal control was also harsh brothers and sisters were taught to respect each other from an early age. Girls were never allowed to dress improperly in front of their brothers. Some of these customs have gone on to the present time, I can tell you. I was the only girl in my family, and I had six brothers who watched over me. These customs sure caused me and some of my friends a lot of tears and heartaches, like when we had boy friends of whom our brothers didn't approve, or when we wanted to be in style and wear shorter skirts. Thanks for watching do like, subscribe and comment.